I always say to Susan, when you're on your deathbed and you're looking back, one thing you don't want to say is, gee, I wish, I wish I'd tried. Are we going to have eight more years of complacency, or are we going to have decisive action? It was a wild summer. Soybeans got to be over eleven and a half dollars. Corn was high. Cattle were crazy high. A lot of things don't get done because people get caught up so much in partisan politics. Dad and I were going back to the airport and pier, taking relatives back to fly after the funeral. Education isn't going to get another dollar until we fix that. We've got to get our priorities straight. By the time we were a few songs into it, the crowd had evacuated. Dad used to have a line that uh, he would use a lot that says, hey, anybody can be governor on a good day, but uh, sometimes we don't have that many good days. She was a rock star, and I was a security detail. We've been robbing the cookie jar. Cookie jar is empty now. No one talked about education, economic development, the balance that I thought was so important to South Dakota had vanished. When things start to slide and not living up to their potential, you put in a new team. You can see the arrow point up dramatically and then flatten for a generation. Good evening. Thank you for taking some time to be with me tonight. My name is Scott Heideprim, and I'm running for governor. I took the unusual step of buying a half hour of TV time because I truly believe the November election is the most important race in a generation. In these 30 minutes, I want to share with you my thoughts on growing up, working, and raising a family in South Dakota. I want you to get a better idea of who I am and what I'm about. I think it helps explain how much I love South Dakota. I also have a couple of special guests who will visit with you this evening about the importance of this election. I hope you enjoy this personal conversation. He was one of the green troops who went into the Battle of the Bulge that you've read about and that Band of Brothers is about. And he was injured and, um, and came back and spent a couple years in hospitals and had to learn to walk again. So when I came along in 1956, he had learned to walk all of the muscles on the left side of his leg had been severed and so he would swing his leg. And so that's my memory of him. I can, I can still see him. Mom had grown up on a farm outside of Lesterville and Utica, outside of Yankton, and went to Yankton College. And her, uh, her first job was teaching in Custer. She had a cousin out there. I can still show you the room that they stayed in and Dad had come back, you know, uh, Purple Heart from World War II, and his dad was the mayor of Custer, and and so they got together then and were married shortly thereafter, and then went back to the U. and Mom taught in, Mom actually Mom's first teaching job was Ravinia, which is in down by Lake Andes, and she came from a very strong family, a farm family down. When I got to know them, they had moved the they had moved from Lesterville, Utica, north of. Yankton to Mission Hill, uh, east of Yankton, between Yankton and Vermilion, and when I would, I'd go down there and spend the summer and work on the farm. So I was basically a member of that family too. They heard Carl Munt give a speech in 1948 about how the Pick Sloan project was going to turn the area between the Missouri River and the Jim River into the next Garden of Eden. And so they looked up and down and said, well, there's Miller, let's go there. The church choir would practice in our house before they would go to sing in church. And our church choir had a reputation for being a really good church choir, you'd have to say that. One time my sister, Rebecca, was coming home from the University of Iowa with her boyfriend, Charlie, and they got in very late Saturday night and they went to their respective rooms, of course, and Charlie said he'd never forget he thought he'd died and gone to heaven because when he woke up this this choir downstairs <laughs> singing, singing some religious song. The law in South Dakota that said interracial marriages were illegal. My dad was just repulsed by that and so he introduced a law that actually passed in South Dakota in 1957. I always think of him as the Atticus Finch of Miller. We would get paid not in chestnuts like Atticus Finch did, but it, but with someone would slaughter, and they'd they'd bring in a side of beef or eggs, 
or a lot of times nothing. And my dad never insisted that people be able to pay. And that's something that I've tried to do too. Um, and he was real good about that. He was a great runner in high school and he had to give that up mm. after he was injured. So that's when he started riding his bike. <laughs> While smoking a pipe. <laughs> that's, when, that's when I first saw him. Susie, first met. <laughs> Susie came to visit me um, in the summer of 1984 when we were dating. And <laughs> I was taking depositions in Pierre that day, and so she got to Miller to my house before I did. And so I said to her, you know, you, my mom will be there waiting for you, <laughs> and, and my dad will come along, and I'll, and I'll get home. And it was a sweltering day. Oh, God. And my mom is sitting on a sofa, damping herself. Susan Trying to chit-chat with me. We'd never met. <laughs> We'd never met before. And I wasn't there. And so they're talking, and Susan looks out the picture window, and there's my dad, though she doesn't know it at the time, riding a lady's bike, because he couldn't swing his leg over the bar. So he had to ride a lady's bike with a plaid sports coat and an orange tie, smoking a pipe on his bike. <laughs> Susan looked out the window and thought, get me out of here. What am I doing? I never saw her in a pair of pants. In fact, one year, my sisters bought her a pair of sweatpants so she could go walking in them, and she put them on under her dress. <laughs>